All right. So I was telling telling Zeke I'm in the middle of grading the tests, but I'm not done yet. There's a decent chance that by the end of lab today, depending on how lab goes, um, I'll have I'll have tests ready to get back. It doesn't take me that long. I just need to actually sit down and do it without getting distracted, and, um, and that's that's fine. So if not if not by the end of the day, then Thursday for sure um, should have the tests back. Um, but what I've seen so far, everything looks good. You know, everything. There's always the first couple of questions. There's always a um, a range of of answers. But um, yeah, overall, it seems like everybody did. I'm not surprised or worried okay. about about scores. It doesn't look like we had any issues with that. So, um, so let that put you at ease while you while you wait for your actual grading back. Um, so we're going to get into this is the part where our where our textbook doesn't quite match the same order. Or sorry, that our material doesn't match the our textbook. The OpenStax textbook, I really like it. It's really good, but I don't like the order of these particular chapters. So we're going to do, I think this is chapters 10 and 11. Um, let me pull up. So if you're in, we, we more, more closely match the order of the materials found in a um, textbook called Klein. The author's name is Klein. Um, and some of those are available. Um, McMurray is the one who wrote the OpenStax textbook in its 10th edition. Um, so it has gone through lots of, of revisions and everything already. Basically, he just brought it over to OpenStax from his culture because he didn't need the money from the publisher. He's getting towards the end of his career. Um, so it's a, again, great textbook, but I don't like the order of some of the uh, chapters. It is incredibly well written. It's like so easy to read. Well. It is. It is. And it, I, it's not a bad idea too, especially for this section where we're going to be a little bit out of order. If you can find, um, you know, there are Various places to find, um, call it heavily discounted, up to a hundred percent discounted PDFs of of Klein um, online, and uh, if if you are able to find those, then that might be that might be helpful just for some of the because it's also very well written in one of the standards. So we we finished through chapter six. Um, for the test. Do that. Um, we, that's where we start talking about reactions and thermochemistry and everything. Then it starts looking at what are called addition reactions and alkenes and alkynes first. We're going to start talking from chapter 10. So we're, and then we're going to come back to 7, 8, and 9, um, probably next quarter. But 10. And 11 in particular, what we're going to spend a good chunk of time on, and then we'll get into some of the, the lab based stuff as well. Um, interpreting spectra, doing some of the qualitative analysis as well. Uh, so, just so you're aware why we're not following it as well. And if you are reading the textbook, if you go to read chapter 10, there's a couple places where it references things from chapter seven that you, we won't have covered yet. So it'll just feel a little bit disjointed for this next portion um, until we come back to chapter seven at the beginning of next quarter. Um, so the, the reason that I wanna get into this is to start it in this order is because this, some of the simplest reactions that we can have are what are called substitution reactions. And so as we're starting to learn mechanisms and get the hang of what's going on with these reactions, like we can think about it in terms of potential energy surfaces, like on the midterm, and we can think about it in terms of rate constant, equilibrium constants, and that's great. Um, but now we need to start getting into assigning mechanism patterns to the various reactions, kind of like, nine and 10 on the test. 
um, except that we're going to get to the point where we can recognize what the reaction is and come up with our own mechanisms instead of just basically doing multiple choice. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense because mechanisms are really tricky and they are the number one sticking point that people cite as the hardest thing about OCHEM. Um, they make sense once you get your head wrapped around the rules. But that's exactly why I think it makes the most sense to start with the simplest reactions. So that's where we'll start with, with substitution reactions and do sort of a deep dive on this really simple reaction. And then we're going to apply those concepts to all the more complicated reactions that we'll see going down the road. Once you get through this first quarter, the rest of the series is going to be more of the same. OCHEM 2 and OCHEM 3 are a lot of, okay, we know how to do mechanisms now. Let's look at this reaction. Let's try and figure out a mechanism. And they just get progressively more complicated and more varied in terms of what types of functional groups we can add, what types of reactions can happen, understanding how conditions affect things. But it's all based on this. So this is going to be some of the bigger concepts that we'll keep coming back to. Um, and in theory, it should make it so that the rest of the mechanisms might feel like some memorizing, but none of them are that tricky on their own. It's just a matter of getting the vocab down once we lay the groundwork. Um, I guess first off, I decided, like I said, I don't have grades for you. Was there any part of the test in particular that you wanted to ask about or go over? There was one question I had. There was. Um... One question where we had to draw resonance forms and then rank priority, and there were yeah. three where the positive charge was a secondary carbocation, and so that I was really confused as far as where to prioritize one or the other. They're they're all going to be about the same priority. Okay, if that's they're, what I so okay. yeah, exactly. So I, I guess um, maybe I should change the language on that. So if to add like a, if they're relatively similar in terms of yeah. priority, just put them all okay. over two. If I recall right. All of those were number three, I think, for that one. Something like that, yeah. Um, because there was one, like your starting structure had no charges and everything with the full valence, so that one was the most stable. Mm -hmm. And then there was one where you had charges, but everything still had a full valence, so that was two. And then there was a bunch of secondary carbocations. There were two or three versions that were secondary carbocations that all would have been third priority. Okay, yeah. Uh, and again, when you're look, when we're looking at the problem after I finish creating these, then we'll we can go through that in more detail on Thursday. The only other question I had too is there was one where um, chlorine can participate in resonance, right? Because it has p orbitals that are it can. Okay. The chlorine does participate in resonance on that one on the on the the diazepam. Yeah, because I've, so I've never seen that before, but I was like, I'm like, it has p orbitals. All the rules make sense. So yeah, exactly. It's got lone pairs that are adjacent to a pi bond. That are in the allylic position to a pi bond. So those chlorine lone pair, each chlorine has one lone pair that can participate with those benzene rings. Um, and that was the most common mistake on that one. The people forgot that the chlorine also had uh, lone pairs. How can it participate? So I'm not going to draw on the whole structure because yeah, that one was kind of a big one, right? Just find the chlorine in my because the chlorine can't have a double bond, can it? Oh, that's what happened. It was zoomed in. It doesn't like to let me draw when it's zoomed in. So this chlorine's got three lone pairs, right? Which means that, that it can give electron density to the benzene ring because this pi bond can move over and those electrons can move over. We get something that looks like a lot of bonds in the same spot. So I'm not making things more complicated. That would give us a negative charge on that carbon, a positive charge on a chlorine. So that's not an ideal. Never seen that before. We see it with oxygen and nitrogen a lot. 
and yeah. oxygen is actually more electronegative than the chlorine. I've never seen a double bond to a hydrogen ever before. It's uh, it is well that's that's it is a little bit of a stretch, which is why it was a pretty minor deduction. Um, that seems like a trick question. You said there were <laughs> trick questions <laughs> on this, so I call bullshit shenanigans. Shenanigans. Uh, one trick question. Yeah, no, that's not fair because there was another trick question on there. The C one to C two. That's another trick question. That's a typo. <laughs> okay, right. Every type typo and trick question. Well, then that's not a uh, double blind, right? Because it's just a little bit of it's, electron density, and that's a minor. Right. It's it, my point is that I've never seen this before, so that was yeah. a trick question. But you can see the lone pairs adjacent to pi bonds for dissipating resonance. It's just a different never, atom. Never on an object. Never have I seen it on an object. We might look at the textbooks. I bet the textbook has it there. I think we talked about it briefly. We spent most of our time with nitrogen and oxygens because that's more common. But again, I will take that under. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I don't really care all that much. Shenanigans, though. <laughs> it is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and that is, you know, the, the other two that, the other pair of electrons that can participate in resonance, and that one were nitrogen. It did do something similar. You gave it nitrogen. Um, Positive, and then. Let's see, it was a nitrogen that had three bonds, and you gave it four bonds in order to, to form a double bond. So it gave the nitrogen a positive charge on that other one. Um, so it's similar in that regard. It just, but it, the other thing is that, Chlorine, as though even though it's less electronegative than oxygen, um, it being larger means that, and the fact that it's three p orbitals that have to overlap with two p orbitals, just the size difference means that they don't actually have as great an overlap, which is one of the reasons why it's a less significant contributor. Gotcha. But it does have still have lone pairs that can be participate. But now we're just splitting hairs, though, right? So. <laughs> Um, again, not as most as important as some of the as a lot of the other stuff in that problem. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so, quick recap on mechanisms: we had most of our electron movement that we're going to see. Most of the reactions that we see are going to be predominantly electron movement because, like we talked about with that Born Oppenheimer approximation. The electrons do the moving and then eventually the nuclei sort of catch up to them, right? So with that in mind, we're always going to be talking about the electrons and the bulk of them um, until we get to the end of next quarter. We will add a new type of, of mechanism step. But until then, pretty much all of your mechanism steps are going to be these four. Um, and in particular, today, we're going to focus on the first two. The first two are the ones that are going to be the, the most significant in terms of actually getting you from reactants to products. And then a lot of times, proton transfer and the rearrangement are sort of the secondary steps that happen along the way. Um, you see a lot of proton transfer to make a leaving group a better leaving group, where you see arrangement to make an unstable intermediate a little bit more stable. Um, but the, the reason that we have those in the first place is because of leaving groups and nucleophilic attacks. So the bulk of, the, of our time is spent on those. Um, and so if we're talking about these alkyl halides, um, alkyl halides in general, like the chlorine we were just talking about, it's just a halogen attached to a carbon. Uh, and so we've already worked on how to name those. And they do have some, some distinct properties of their own. And there's some, a further characterization. Um, the terms alkyl, aryl, and vinyl are kind of like, they're similar to that allylic position um, that we've talked about before. So allylic meant you know, one spot removed from a lone pair, right? Or from a pi bond. So for instance, this would be an allylic chlorine um, because it's attached to a carbon that is one carbon removed from a pi bond. If you have something, a chlorine directly attached to a carbon with a pi bond, the, the adjective to describe that carbon is a vinyl carbon. 
Um, and that's actually where where vinyl, the you know, material gets its name. Um, PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride. And that's basically you start with this molecule and you let it react with itself a whole bunch to make one giant molecule. And they call that a polymerization reaction. So this is just vinyl chloride. You let it react with itself, you get polyvinyl chloride or PVC. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, so vinyl fluorine and PVC pipes, it's made out of the same material. They're both, they're all just PVC, which starts from this molecule. And then you let that molecule react. And if you can change the conditions a little bit, you can change the properties slightly. The PVC is a little bit more rigid than we think of vinyl fluorine, um, but not by that much. If you think about those vinyl, the imitation floors that they make now out of vinyl, if you've ever picked up one of those pieces, it's, it's about as thick as a thin piece of PVC pipe, and it's about the same rigidity. Because basically all that's different about it is it's colored and textured on the top so that it looks like a wood plank. Um, so if you've ever, when you hear the term vinyl in chemistry, this is specifically what it means. That you've got that a vinyl carbon is one of the two carbons in the alkene. And something in the vinyl position means it's directly attached to one of those carbons. Because we'll, we'll also talk about vinyl alcohols um, or... Uh, vanillic, if you add it, V-I-N-Y-L-L-I-C, um, a vanillic stretch is a type of bond, is a frequency that these things can absorb light in um, that has to do with the fact that a vanillic um, carbon is going to have a certain vibrational frequency. So you know, when we see these terms, that's what we're talking about. And um, er Errol, I'm never actually sure how to pronounce that one. It doesn't get used that as often, uh, but it's similar to vinyl, except on a benzene ring. So aryl just means directly attached to a benzene ring. Um, and then most of commonly, if you have an, a halide attached to an sp3 carbon, it's an alkyl halide. Alkyl group just means sp3 carbons. So technically this allylic um, carbon is an S, is an alkyl carbon as well. If if it's an a, a um, alkyl carbon, an sp three carbon in the allylic position, both of those can be true at the same time. And so all I, mean, I guess I can't really even say that. Um, all these different terms or different ways of describing these specific things. We'll try to make sure that we're being consistent with how we use them. Um, but I just don't want you to be surprised because if we start talking about interpreting these spectra in particular, talking about IR spectra and NMR spectra, um, for instance, vinyl hydrogens show up in a different spot than aerial hydrogens, which show up in a different spot than allylic hydrogens, which show up in a different spot than pure alkyl hydrogens. Um, and so those distinctions wind up being important as we're describing these structures. Even if your um, fluorine is not included there, just is it because it behaves differently, it's small and really electronegative? It's smaller and more electronegative. And so it doesn't get, it doesn't react the same way. Mm -hmm. If you try to use fluorine as a, the, the key characteristic of these alkyl halides that is that they, they're, um, they can act both as a nucleophile and as a pretty good leaving group. And fluorine is not very good at either of those because it's so much more electronegative. Um, so while technically it would be considered an alkyl halide, it wouldn't be for the, for the purpose of these reactions that we're going to talk about. All right, and so the nice thing about alkyl halides, and most of what we're going to talk about is going to be alkyl halides. Those vinyl halides don't react in the same way, and the aerial halides will undergo what are what's called electrophilic substitution that we're going to add next quarter. Um, but the alkyl halides in particular go through uh, nucleophilic reactions, um, one of which is called substitution, which is exactly what it sounds like. You've got an alkyl halide 
and you've got a nucleophile, your nucleophile can come in and attach and replace that, that alkyl halide. Um, and remember, a nucleophile can basically be anything with a lone pair or a negative charge. So this gives us a lot of possibilities when it comes to making new molecules if we started with an alkyl halide. Um, and the other reaction that it goes through is tied to these substitution reactions, these elimination reactions um, happen when your nucleophile leaves and instead of something else, come, a new nucleophile coming in to attach, um, it just makes a pi bond instead. All right, so your net result for a substitution is you, you pulled off the halide and you replaced it with a different nucleophile. The net result for elimination is you remove your halide again, but instead of attaching something else in its spot, you make a pi bond instead. Now, figuring out exactly which pi bond you make or which carbon forms the pi bonds um, or which of these two reactions winds up taking precedence is going to be the, the trickiest part in these. Um, but we'll start by actually just going through and learning these mechanisms because then we can start to, to sort of predict, okay, under these conditions, elimination is favored. Under these conditions, substitution is favored. But basically, since because most of our nucleophiles are also weak bases or strong bases in some cases, these are always going to be sort of competing reactions where these two things happen simultaneously, right? Because for something to be a nucleophile, it needs to have a lone pair and, and strongest nucleophiles have a negative charge. That's the same exact thing that we would say to describe what can be a base, right? Anything that can be a base needs to have a lone pair, preferably a negative charge. So how do we know whether something's going to act as a nucleophile or a base is going to depend on the conditions and just what our leaving group is, what our halide is, what the specific base slash nucleophile is. Different molecules can react differently in favor of being a nucleophile over a base. All right, so let's start by just trying to fill it in before we get into the mechanism of it. Let's say we've got this 2-chloropropane and we've got NaOH. And I'm just telling you, ignore the elimination aspect for now. I'm just going to say it does a sub goes through a substitution. What is the product going to be? Does the hydroxide group will replace the chlorine? Yeah, so basically this Na plus is just there to balance the chart, right? Our hydroxide is the actual nucleophile in this case. So you just kick off the chlorine and attach the OH in its place. And then you still have the sodiums floating around, but they don't really do anything. All right, so your net result for a substitution is always just going to be something like that. Find your leaving group, which is our, our halides in this case, and then figure out what your nucleophile is and just swap them basically. Now, what if it goes through elimination? Hydroxide is a good nucleophile, but it's also a good base. So if it goes through if it goes through an elimination reaction, we're still going to, to chop this chlorine off, but instead of attaching a hydroxide, the hydroxide is going to grab one of the hydrogens from an adjacent carbon. Because remember, we have all of these hydrogens attached right here, right? So if hydroxide, instead of acting as a nucleophile, instead of coming in here and attacking this carbon, if it just grabs one of these hydrogens instead, these electrons can move over. We wind up making protein. And really, if I'm showing this, all of these mechanism steps, 
leaving. This is this is a combination of proton transfer and a leaving group leaving at the same time. Will you always for for alkene from an elimination? Um, unless it's a double elimination, in which case you make an alkyne. But just yeah, one step, one step at a time. Uh, an yeah. Okay. Right. So alkenes make limit our elimination reactions make alkenes. Substitution reactions can make a bunch of different functional groups depending on what your nucleophile is, but they always just look like your leaving group leaves and your nucleophile attaches where it was. Right. Right. So they're in both cases, they're a combination of two of those different mechanism patterns. So this is a leaving group leaves and a proton transfer happening at the same time. And then the last arrow is just these electrons move over to fill the valence because this chlorine leaving leaves an empty spot on that carbon, right? This one, it's, it's still gonna be leaving group leaves and takes its electrons with it. But instead of this hydroxide grabbing a hydrogen from an adjacent so carbon, it just attaches. And that's the difference between it acting as a base and a nucleophile. When it's acting as a nucleophile, it's attacking a carbon. When it's acting as a base, it's attacking a proton, an H plus. It's accepting. It's accepting an H plus. Yeah. yeah. Right. But they they're very similar, right? In both cases, it's the negative charge going after the positive charge to kind of balance everything out, right? It's just does it go for the carbon or does it go for the hydrogen? I'm trying to apply the Lewis base acid base. Ron said Lowry is the better way to think about it for the most part. Okay. Because Lewis acids and bases, you're talking about the electrons, which I guess you could, but. Um, so the original molecule is accepting the electrons that, that's. That's acting acid. as the. Acid. Yes. So then this would be the base. So this would be the base either way, right? So a Lewis base is also a nucleophile. Right. Sort of by definition, it's just different perspectives on it. Exactly, and that's that's one of the reasons why we we stick to the Bronsted Lowry for the most part is because it allows us to differentiate between these because we can say it's acting as a base, a nucleophile is also acting as a base, right? But it's confusing to try and say that, so we just say it's acting as a base when it's a proton acceptor, and it's acting as a nucleophile when it's acting as a Lewis base and attacking a carbon. Gotcha. I like that. Um, and as I mentioned before, these are always going to be competing reactions, right? So like the hydroxide could be a, a base or a nucleophile, which means under different conditions, we can wind up making both products. So we can make the elimination product and the substitution product at the same time. And so this leads us to, this is one of the reasons why organic chemists get kind of sloppy about balancing reactions, because this is not truly a balanced reaction, the way it's written right here, unless you consider the fact that this elimination product and substitution product, they're really going to be a percentage. If you started with 100% of the chloropropane, and then you wind up making 75% and 25%, it is still balanced in the sense of conservation of mass and you still have the same number of carbons before and after, but you don't get a true balanced reaction in terms of like a, an integer coefficient in front of each of these. They're going to be a percentage because you've got both of these things happening simultaneously. Um, and, and that is a lot of times what you'll see is we'll just say, because it's the as we learned when we talked about thermodynamics and rates, um, you know, there's a lot of different variables that go into which pathway is going to be favored. And so something as small as performing the reaction at 20 Celsius instead of 25 Celsius could throw off the actual percentage numbers. So usually you won't see numbers associated with this unless they're being very specific about the conditions. You'll just see major product and minor product. And major product just means more than 50% of the time you get this. Major product can be anything from 51% to 99.99%. Uh, probably, we probably would call, we got something if the minor product was 
like 0 0.01 percent. We probably we probably wouldn't even call that a minor product. We we'll probably call that a trace. Okay. Like you like leave a trace of something just barely there. There's a small tiny amount of it, but not really a measurable amount. So I guess minor product would probably be anything from like five percent to fifty percent could be considered a minor product. Uh, but again, those specific numbers can also change when you change the conditions. We can get these to switch if we switch the temperature, for instance, or the concentrations. And that's what a big chunk of our the rest of this class is going to be about is how do we how do we switch these two or how do we emphasize this more? So maybe it's 75 to 25 right now, but maybe we want to make it 90 to 10. How do we control the conditions to try and get more of the major product and less of the minor product? Will pressure be? Pressure comes into play sometimes, especially if we have a gas as one of our reactants or one of our products. Um, I've been worried about my product from two weeks ago. That's what we, we also try to seal them as well as, as we yeah. can too, because yeah, a lot of these things will evaporate and it's a Le Chatelier's thing. If we're sitting there at equilibrium, with some amount of product, but then some of your product keeps evaporating away, you can wind up with that messing with the Chateliers and wind up with the reaction shifting back or forward depending on, on what's going on. So again, we're gonna always come back to the Chateliers and those ideas about thermodynamics um, and, and kinetics for that reason. Um, so why do we talk about this in terms of alkyl halides the most? It, you know, this reaction seems like a substitution or an elimination. Either of those, all you really need is a decent leaving group for either of those to happen. You need a nucleophile or a base. But why do we start by talking about alkyl halides for these? Well, it's because they're good leaving groups. Because they have that large difference in electronegativity to the carbon, um, but they're also relatively stable once they've left. Hydroxide's not all that stable on its own, which is why it's a pretty good base and a pretty good nucleophile. But iodides, chlorides, bromides, we have, see those just floating around in solution all the time. They're not really all that reactive, right? And so because there's good leaving groups, that means that they're good targets for the nucleophiles. The carbon, so not only do you have that partial, that difference in electronegativity, but also the fact that, that these leaving groups can leave really well. Um, that results in a very useful tool when it comes to making other molecules or controlling these. Um, and this is also just a, these are not really to scale because chlorine and bromine and iodine are going to get larger as well, which means you're going to have less electron density in those bonds. That sigma bond that's holding the halide to the carbon gets progressively weaker as your halide gets bigger because those, the orbitals are just not even to say those are not the same size. We're talking about N equals three orbitals for the chlorine to the carbon. That's weaker than an N equals two bond between the chlorine and the carbon. N equals two and N equals two here, those are the same energy level. They get really good overlap between those bonds. Compared to chlorine, doesn't bond quite as well. And bromine, a little bit less. And iodine, even less than that. And that's part of what makes them good leaving groups is that difference in size. And we can rank that in terms of how good of an acid they are as well. Things that are good acids are also good leaving groups. So we're going to always come back to pKa's again because that's a good way of putting a number to how good of a leaving group is something. Something with a really low pKa means that it's going to be a really good leaving group most of the time as well. Because if it's got a really if it's got a really low pKa, that means that it's really a really strong acid, and it means that its conjugate base is pretty stable on its own. 
the same thing we were talking about up here as a leaving group. Right, so with that in mind, when we look at these, this, this is also the other reason why we look at PKA tables in OCHEM. We, we led up to it talking about acids and bases and protonated versus deprotonated. Here's the, this is the other really, really good um, use for these PKA values. They allow us to compare how good of a leaving group is something. Anything that's a stable base is going to be a really, the conjugate acid is going to be a really strong acid. And if it's a, if it's a really weak base, it's a really good leaving group as well. And if something is a really, is a strong base, it typically is also a good nucleophile and a bad leaving group. All of these are different sides of the same thing, right? So, Bad leaving groups are strong bases and also pretty good nucleophiles for the most part. Good leaving groups are weak bases, bad nucleophiles, because they're pretty stable already. Uh, and there are some, some other qualifications for why some things are better. Some things can be a strong base, but not a good nucleophile. But most of those are going to come down to sterics. The one in particular is this molecule here, uh, which we call T-butoxide. It's a T-butyl group with an oxygen attached to it. So it's a it's protonated form. Looks like this. So that one. It's, um, but if you deprotonate it, you get an oxygen with a negative charge. Oxygen with a negative charge are pretty good bases, just like hydroxide, right? Um, this is a pretty good base. It's a really bad nucleophile, though, because it's got this big, bulky, steric group that's basically getting in the way. So it's, things like this are good bases, but bad nucleophiles. And under the right conditions, you can take something and you can make it a good nucleophile, but a bad base by changing, doing things like changing what solvent you're working in. Um, because if you change what solvent you're working in, you're going to affect how often it's protonated at it, or what the intermolecular forces are around the molecule. And so you can cause something to be a good nucleophile, but a bad base in that, in that circumstance by controlling the, the, um, Something like a nonpolar solvent. I'm using a nonpolar solvent. We'll get we'll get more specific with it, but there's a class of solvents called protic polar aprotic solvents. They're polar molecules that don't have a proton, so they can't act as an acid, but they are still polar to some extent. So acetone is the classic example. Acetone is a polar molecule because you've got this carbon oxygen polar bonds and some asymmetry there, but it's not, it can't act as an acid because it doesn't have any hydrogens that are attached to the oxygen. Under the right conditions, could it act as an acid? Since if we, if we acidified it, if we gave it, if we started from acetone and then dumped a bunch of HCl in it, basically you can protonate that. I was thinking more of that, that oxygen. The, maybe the methyl solution. Okay, and if you go extreme the other way, if you put it into an extreme with a very, very strong base, you can deprotonate these ones. Yeah. Um, but those are kind of the, the extreme conditions. Yeah. Um, so with all that in mind, these are all the variables that we're trying to consider when we're looking at which of these mechanisms is going to be favored at any given time. Good base with a bad nucleophile is going to favor elimination. Good nucleophile but a bad base is going to favor substitution. So we can switch those major and minor products by controlling things like what solvent are we using or what nucleophile or base are we using. So we've already talked about this a little bit, but just to Bromine. Yeah, in this case, so bromine is hot, is it hydrobromic acid is a stronger acid than water. 
the conjugate base for water is hydroxide. And so that would be all the way down here. And a conjugate base here would be the bromide. So this is the hydrobromic acid, a stronger acid than water, which means its conjugate base is more stable than water's conjugate base. And if the base is more stable, then that means it's a better leaving group. So bullet point is stronger acid, then the conjugate base is a better leaving group. Trying to think of if I there's always there's always exceptions here and there, and solvent in particular, solvent stabilizing the leaving groups can wind up changing these a little bit. Right. Um, but that's our general rule. It's higher on this table, and the conjugate base is a better leaving group. We have this table available for like a test. I, I think that that's what I've done in the past on the final is I'll give you a table similar to this. Yeah. Um, not with this piece, but a, just a table of functional groups and PKAs. Yeah. Yeah. So you still have to know how to use it, what it means. Yeah, the halogen is going to be super useful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a reason that's this is exactly why this chapter starts with alkyl halides as your prototypical leaving group mm -hmm. because they are the best leaving groups that there are commonly available. Um, although you can, some of these wind up being interesting, really useful. And this is also why fluorine is not considered one of those, right? Fluorine's got a pKa of five. Remember these pKa values, these are base 10 or log scale, right? So a difference of 10 pH units means that chlorine is a 10 to the 10 times better at being a leaving group than fluorine is. Fluoride is actually a decent nucleophile it's and a decent base. Um, so you can, that's why it is its own category for that reason. Um, the other thing to point out here, the other reason, this is the reason the proton transfer steps wind up being really important here is you'll notice, so water and, and its conjugate base hydrox, hydroxide's got a pKa, pKa of 15.7, right? Pretty, pretty strong base. Hydronium though, has a pKa of negative two, which means H2O is a good leaving group. Hydroxide's not, but, I, but water is a good leaving group. So this is the other thing that can change here is if you can protonate your leaving group, you can make it a better leaving group. I was going to my question about this molecule, if we added another hydrogen to it. Right, so if you added another hydrogen to it, you can protonate that. It would still be, this one is the better. Bromine would group. still be a better leaving group. This one's better than the previous one. Exactly. And so a lot of times, that's what I was, when I went through the mechanism. So before I said, you know, we, the proton transfer steps and the rearrangements are sort of like ancillary. And that's because the proton transfer step can get us to favor a leaving group better, being a better leaving group. Um, even though the proton transfer step itself is not going to define the reaction. But you can basically, you can get, if we had chloride as our nucleophile, if we are under acidic conditions, we can actually replace an OH group with a fluoride, with a fluoride. Even though fluoride is technically a halide, and we usually think about it as being a leaving group. But under the right conditions, we can protonate the oxygen and make it a better leaving group. And then the fluoride is then a good enough nucleophile that can come in and replace it. So all of these things are sort of sliding scales. There's enough variables and enough, enough tools that we have that once we understand them, we can kind of pick and choose our way through it and get the substitution to happen the way we want it to. I'm noticing that there's at least uh, two or more difference in pKa between them, except for the water and what is it? I'm not sure what kind Ethanol. of ethanol. Ethanol. Yeah. Um, so that and that's that's just cherry picking these a little bit. You know, this is showing water and a primary alcohol. 
all primary alcohols are going to be around the same ballpark. Okay. And then this is a tertiary alcohol that's all the way up at 18, but the secondary alcohols are going to be in there as well, somewhere in between those. And all secondary, like there's resonance effects that can make them shift a couple of, a couple of units here or there um, and things like that. Um, for instance, it's not on here, but phenol is this molecule has a pKa in the six range, even though it's an alcohol, but because there's so much resonance, it can wind up being deprotonated a lot easier than a normal secondary alcohol. So this is just a very, not a, a comprehensive list by any stretch. It's from max to Right, and it's just specific. And this is actually usually the way you'll see them arranged in OCHEM textbooks. Um, is they don't arrange them alphabetically. Right. They arrange them by PKA value for this reason. Um, so that you can quickly look at it and see what's a stronger acid or a stronger base or better nucleophile, et cetera. Um, but yeah, the, the version that's in the at the end of the chapter that's in the front in the front uh, cover of the textbook, there's usually like some tables, you know, um, and it'll it would be a much more comprehensive list of PKAs. And there you go, there's our, our other example we were just talking about, right? Once you propanate that oxygen, now we're talking about our conjugate base is up here. And so we've got that as a better leaving group than the fluoride, just by taking that same molecule and adding some strong acid to start the process. Right, so under basic conditions, the fluoride would be a better leaving group, but under acidic conditions, the water is a better leaving group. All right, let's let's take our break here. Um, we'll come back at eleven, and we'll actually get into the the two possible mechanisms for substitution. And uh, and try and, and think about those reactions a little bit. So, let me call. Grab a snack. What do you do on your breaks? Lab today. Um, what do you want? I mean, I'll, I'll be there. But what, what do you want me to do? Um. So. We'll, we'll have you jump in with with one of the other groups. Okay. We had two groups. On that, that did the first. This is the second part of a two week lab. Yeah. Um, and so, what we'll have you do is just jump in with one of the groups. And then, probably, what we'll do going forward with five people is we'll do three setups. Okay. Um, but it's all very kind of collaborative. Ooh. So, but the more setups and more apparatuses we have going, um, the better chance that at least one of you has a successful result. Right. Because that is sort of a moving target sometimes. Yeah. Um, with organic chemistry and you know, um, especially at altitude. Oh, altitude okay. messes with organic chemistry procedures a lot um, because of the difference in boiling points. Yeah. Um, so uh, for today though, since it's the second part of a two week lab, we'll just have you jump in with one of the other groups. I would anticipate we'll have at least one or two more people that are, show up for lab that didn't make lecture. Yeah. Um, cool. So but we'll go from there. Awesome, is that the plan?
going to be distilling that from the right lab. Uh, so it's a little bit more complex than that. We're going to we're going to do it's called a workup. Okay. Um, which basically means take your raw product and clean it up. So there's a distillation piece to it, but there's some other things we need to do to make sure that we use up the excess reactant and things like that. That'll help make it more stable and more pure. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For uh, Chem 103, we did biodiesel. We had to clean it. Right. In the same sort of deal. Exactly. Yeah, you can't just throw it in there. That's my favorite paradox. <laughs> it's intentionally left blank, but by printing that, it's not left blank. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, pretty big. Um, We're going to have the lab to ourselves today. We'll see. Usually, attendance picks up for lab, right. even if you're not able to make it for lecture, because the recordings make it easy to make up the lectures. It's, yeah. They've tried it. <laughs> have you played like the lab video games? Oh, yeah. They have little sim simulations that they have. Drags a little beaker over here. If like an actor like Rockstar made that game and they actually went into it, like the and then you put on a VR headset, yeah, <laughs> like if, if a real video game developer made that game, yeah. it would be over the top. You'd actually win something. <laughs> I bet that's not too far off. I don't think. Not a lot of money in it. No. <laughs> no so there'll be some board chemist at one point. Also a coder. Eight and a half billion dollars to steal someone's car car. That's Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they generated eight and a half billion dollars. That's wild. To let people steal cars. Speaking of cars, did you get the bolts figured out? Yeah. Um bake them or what did you do? I didn't bake them, I just left them in the next to the heater and I took the magnet away from them. Mm. So I assumed that. It would just have the opposite effect. Yeah. <laughs> if, if nothing else, the magnet, magnetic field would just go into the toolbox and I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. And then it worked, they were not sticking together anymore. Yeah, they weren't sticking together anymore after nice. like two days. And it took a while to get the actual harness and everything. But it's all together now. It ran first try. Oh, that's awesome. First crank, yeah. yeah nice. It like coughed for a second and then never fired right up. <laughs> <laughs> it's Toyota. It okay. seems to always happens. Yeah. <laughs> And Honda's too. Honda's just fire red right up. No yeah. problem. They don't even cop. Yeah. <laughs> well, Japanese cars seem to just be the most reliable by far. Their tolerances are so much smaller from all their manufacturing processes. I've been looking into the speed of air pistons. You yeah, guys told me about that last class. They're like shaped like a golf ball on the head. Oh, interesting. On the head of the piston. Yeah. Like being pulled. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, there's some sort of uh, performance. It's not really going to put any strain on your motor. It's more just for like fuel efficiency and oh, interesting. yeah, huh. all that. A little so, bit of horsepower. So it looks like I did not give them the full table of PKA values, but I gave them this sort of cheat sheet figure. That looks at okay, these are the ones that are strong bases, but weak nucleophiles, these are strong bases and strong nucleophiles, these are weak bases, strong nucleophiles, and these are weak bases, weak nucleophiles. Mm -hmm. So that it's a it's similar to having that that whole table, just more compact, because I also had to give them a bunch of stuff for IR and NMR. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I don't know if you don't remember writing all that. <laughs> yeah, it's not worth it. 
there's there's no need. Right. So, but we have a few more minutes, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go grab some caffeine real quick. I'll be right back. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I'm saying no to the sugar here. No, it's making me feel better. And it's more protein than sugar, so that's yeah, good. Long <laughs> burn. Yeah. 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 Really, the only time I notice I ever get angry is when I just don't have enough protein. I don't really eat protein anymore. It's the cheapest way to eat, it seems. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we went, my buddy and I went to Rayleigh's last night because it was just close. We were at the climbing gym, like the Dosada. We went over to Rayleigh's. You got like a bag of chips, some salsa, and a frozen pizza, and like a thing of like green smoothie, and it was like $30. Fuck that, that was weird. Start eating hot ramen here. <laughs> I've just been finding good deals on meat. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no butter or anything because butter's fucking expensive. <laughs> right. I'm just doing a lot of chicken. I'm getting my chicken thighs for about 50 a pound. Chicken doesn't seem to go as far as anything else. Like red meat just seems to fill me up a lot more and yeah. you know, keeps me full for longer and like nuts and shit. Yeah, no, for sure. The chicken's just it's cheap and it's like I never get tired of it. So quick. I used to work over at Park Prime though, so I was eating fucking like filet mignon and shit. Oh, and well, here in strip and ribeye. Amazing. Just all day, pretty much. <laughs> you know, just alive. Oh, I won't be happy. My <laughs> <laughs> colon's not my problem, that's everybody else's problem. <laughs> If I have a choice between a steak or chicken, I'll take the steak every time. I think I'm going to see it. <laughs> Just do a lot of rice bowls, too. Just cook a pot of rice, super cheap, get some chicken in there, some veggies, you know, whatever. Throw some chipotle mayo on there and call it a day. Beer's really good, too. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps me full. <laughs> right. Not hungry so much. <laughs> And then there's always fasting. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was walking up the like, like, with a bouldering area and I recognized this. Oh, it's Jim. At one point, I was like the only person that went to the climbing gym, you know, like two years straight. And then everybody started going there and it was like there was no room for me to do what I like to do there anymore. So yeah, <laughs> no, I guess it gets crowded. Yeah. I would be well, there. It's the celebrities, right? And so it's what's his name? We do the free solo. Oh um, Paul yeah. will be in. Yeah. Um, he uh he climbs there during the winter, doesn't he? Does he? Mm -hmm. Somebody said that they saw him there. I think Carl saw him, took his kids and saw him. Nice. I've never seen him there. I was uh this must be a recent thing. Uh, I've in the last year, yeah. it was sometime in the last year. So it's just too packed, too bad. Yeah. I mean, North He's got all the so much good mm -hmm. like, Yeah, and it shows your right. If there's any sort of decent weather, mm -hmm. then then most people would rather be outside. But it's yeah. so much easier if you only have an hour. Mm -hmm. And there's a sauna at this gym. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, that's absolutely game changer. changer. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> all right. Let's um, let's talk about their mechanisms. Back to minimize again. So our two possible mechanisms here are, and this is basically the way we we break this down. It's sort of like a flow chart where you can break it down into a series of yes or no questions, right? So we kind of kind of design these distinctions so that everything, everything is in one or the other. So for this one in particular, it's either a concerted mechanism or 
It's not a concerted mechanism, which we call a stepwise mechanism. Um, and so the concerted mechanism, and really, I get, I said this for this particular mechanism, but all mechanisms are one of these two options, right? It's a binary classification system. You can't have something that is kind of a concerted mechanism. Right? Just by, by sheer definition, it's either concerted or it's not. Of course, as soon as I say that, I start thinking about it and realize, and like, ah, you could argue that a proton transfer to make something a better leaving group and then a concerted step. But anyway, um, so if it's a concerted mechanism, then we have our nucleophile attacking carbon. We have our leaving group leaving at the same time. But it's possible for you to have the leaving group leave which then leaves an open spot for your nucleophile to come in. Right, so the stepwise mechanism for this particular mechanism would only would be a two-step mechanism. Leaving group leaves and then the nucleophile attacks, as opposed to leaving group leaves and nucleophile attacks at the same time. And the nice thing about this distinction is that we can actually test this because if it's a concerted mechanism, it should be a second order rate law. Right? Because if it's a concerted mechanism, then, then the rate is going to rely on your nucleophile has to bump into your carbon in order for this to happen, right? If it's a stepwise mechanism, the slow step is actually going to be leaving group leaves because you're making an intermediate that's less stable than what you started with. Right? In terms of potential energy surface, up here, a potential energy surface would look like this. Our potential energy surface for this stepwise one would look something like that. Even if it's the same overall change in energy, so I didn't really drop to scale, but assume I did. Your slow step, kind of by definition in this case, because you're making a carbocation that's less stable, your slow step has to be the first step, and your, which means your slow step only involves one molecule. And if your slow step only involves one molecule, it's going to be a first order reaction. So all we have to do to test this to figure out which of these two options um, this mechanism is, is we just have to, to do a method of initial rates. Double your concentration of the nucleophile and see if your rate doubles. And double your concentration of your leaving group and see if your rate doubles. That one should double either way, right? Doubling this concentration because this is, regardless of which of these two possibilities, um, your concentration of your starting material, your carbon-based material, is going to be part of the rate-limiting step either way. But then doubling your concentration of the nucleophile, if you double your concentration of the nucleophile and your rate doubles, it's concerted. If you double your concentration of the nucleophile and nothing changes, it's stepwise. So can I look at it as concerted as a nucleophilic attack that influences the loss of a leaving group? And then the other way, the step yeah. back would be the loss of the leaving group makes it more ideal for a nucleophilic attack. Right. So in the concerted mechanism, the nucleophile is pushing the leaving group out the door um, versus a stepwise mechanism is your leaving group leaves and then gives you an open spot. You think about it like people waiting for a table at a crowded bar. There's the people that'll just wait for somebody to leave and then they'll go over. And then there's the people that'll go stand and look over your shoulder while you're finishing your drink <laughs> and to try and like encourage you to leave. Gotcha. That's the nuclear <laughs> that that the attack. Sure. Okay. They're not going to come sit down at your table until you leave, yeah. but they might make you leave faster. <laughs> That's what I order in a movie. <laughs> Right, you're bad leaving. <laughs> <laughs>
I should say you and I are bad speakers. <laughs> I like to be contradictory like that, Jill. Um, so the way we describe this concerted mechanism is, is we just use abbreviations because chemists do that for everything, right? Um, if it's concerted, we call it an SN2 reaction. It's a substitution nucleophilic second order. Um, and so you can think of the two as either being the, the definition is bimolecular, which but that also means it's a second order reaction. So the two, you can think of the two either way. It's meaning either of those things. So this stepwise mechanism would still be a substitution. It would still be nucleophilic, but it would be first order. So that mechanism, the concerted mechanism we call SN2, the stepwise mechanism we call SN1. Right? They have the same, they're the same net result most of the time. But whether or not, whether you go through an intermediate or not is going to influence some things, not just the rate law, but also what type of product you get. We'll talk about the specifics there, but having an intermediate with a positive charge does a few things to the geometry and the stereochemistry. So it'll look, in most circumstances, these two mechanisms will give you the same product. But there are a couple of cases where you can have a rearrangement happen if it's SM1, but not if it's SM2. Where you have a um, SM2 reactions retain stereochemistry. If you start with a with a specific stereoisomer, you'll end with a specific stereoisomer. But going through the stepwise mechanism, you don't, because this intermediate is, SN, is uh, SP2, so it's planar, mm -hmm. which means you lose all of your stereochemistry if you go through a stepwise mechanism, but you retain the stereochemistry if, it's, if you go through the concerted mechanism. All right, so let's say we did these, these experiments. This is kind of the, the process for how a lot of this was decided early on, is that when they knew these reactions would happen, and as they started to understand how electrons and orbitals worked, organic chemists in the early 1900s started putting together bits of experimental data to try and predict, okay, which of these mechanisms makes the most sense. So one example is you test if it's first order or second order. So in this case, let's see, we did the experiment. We found out that it's the reaction second order. They also found that adding methyl groups to the active carbon slows it down. So chloromethane reacts faster than chloroethane. And they also found if it was, if you started with one specific stereoisomer, you only saw one stereoisomer for your product. So if you started with bromobutane, that's a, a stereospecific carbon, right? If this reaction goes through the SN2 mechanism, then we only get one product. And what they found was if, if you started with R to bromobutane and use hydroxide as your nucleophile, this would be your product. You only get the S. So that tells us something about the mechanism as well. Right, so 
Um, so what would adding, if you add methyl groups to the active carbon, why would that slow the reaction down? More sterics, just more stuff in the way. If you're trying to bring your nucleophile in and attack the active carbon, you've got to have a room to get to the active carbon. So that makes a lot of sense. And we can see that too. If we look at, if we just build ball and stick models of uh, methyl, uh, two chloromethyl propane versus methane. There's just a lot more stuff in the way that's going to make it harder for your nucleophile to attach. And so the nucleophile is coming in the, in the opposite side of the, of the chlorine. The nucleus, well, so that's that's the other question. So here's the results or the conclusions we can draw. The second order, we know that the transition state involves both reactants, that it's biomolecular, we like we talked about. Adding the methyl groups to the active carbon slows things down. That implies that sterics are important, right? Only one stereoisomer is involved or, or is uh, observed. Then there's really two options. You can either have your nucleophile come in from the same side as your leaving group or from your opposite side of your leaving group. Well, think about the same reaction we were just talking about. So bromine reacts with hydroxide. If it attacked from the front side, from the same side as the bromine, we would get the same orientation of everything, right? So if it attacked from halfway one here, we should see the same orientation at the end, right? We've been slid in here, bumped the chlorine out of the way, or the whatever your leaving group is, bromine in this case, out of the way, and your new nucleophile attaches there. So we basically just run this test, do the same thing, say, okay, well, if it's only going through pathway one, we should see this. If it's only going through pathway two, we should see it flip. And that is, in fact, what we see. When it attacks from pathway one, you get the same stereochemistry, the same positioning. And when it attacks from, from pathway two, you get the opposite stereochemistry. Right? And we can explain that with orbitals. So we do, in fact, see that it goes through this inversion of the stereochemistry. We get, if we started with the r bromobutane our mechanism looks like that, and we wind up with Hydroxide attacking from the rear, from the rear, and so we, if we look at what that looks like, what the orbitals look like, your nucleophile is going to have an orbital. It's going to have a these this negative charge, right? This lone pair of electrons, basically. And in order to start making a new bond, it basically is going to come in here and start overlapping orbital density with the anti-bonding orbital from your carbon halogen bond. And the antibonding orbital is oriented so that in order for it to be able to come up here and get a good overlap, it needs to come from the same side. It could, in theory, come this way if it brought the red phase up from this side, but then look how skinny this is, how small of an area that is. And just purely from sterics, there's less room on this side. So what happens instead is it approaches, they call this backside attack. So if you've got your leaving group is leaving through the, the back, the front door, your nucleophile is coming in the back door. Right, and what that results in 
is your, your transition state is going to look like you start to form this bond at the same time as this bond starts to get weaker. So this is getting further and further away. What's that going to do to these hydrogens? Yeah, it's going to push them so that their transition state, they're going to look pretty close to flat. Because in your transition state, you don't have either of these bonds formed or broken. You're kind of halfway. You've got half of a bond here and half of a bond here. So it's not really going to act like it's tetrahedral. It's going to be more like it's trigonal by per pyramidal. You remember that from the Vesper geometries, right? And that means these wind up flattening out, become plane. But that's a little bit, that transition state is a little bit like, um, like an umbrella turning inside out. I know, I think I've used that analogy once in here already, right? There's a point when your umbrella is turning inside out where everything is planar. But that's your transition state. That's a local energy maximum. It's not going to stay there for more than instantaneous. Like there is a point where that is true, but it, it will not exist for really a, for a finite amount of time because it's just a momentary you know, trying to think of what the right word is, um, state, momentary state on its way from one stable state to the next stable state. Potential energy maximum. Right? It's in the potential energy maximum. Right? And so that looks like, we, so I refer to this as an umbrella flip because it also physically, these hydrogens are kind of looking like an umbrella flipping. They're pointed this way, so your umbrella is concave left in this orientation. Then it flattens out and you get that transition state and then it's reversed and it becomes concave right as this sleeping group leaves. And so that's why we see only one of our stereo centers or only one stereochemistry, stereoisomer, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, if we start with a single stereoisomer, we only get one stereoisomer and it's flipped because it has to go through that umbrella. And, and so that's, this is what that would look like. We did have that planar state, that transition state. We could isolate it for just a second. We can do that computationally. When we look at these geometries, we can calculate where the potential energy minimums are um, to find what the most stable geometries are. You can actually calculate it just use the, using calculus terms, you can calculate that potential energy maximum. Um, with, and what that does is if all of these different atoms moving around give, give it different vibrations, each of those vibrations has a specific frequency that you can measure, a frequency of light that it will absorb. At a transition state, you actually get an imaginary number. <laughs> for one of those gradients because you wind up with it being a positive instead of a negative in, in these calculations. And the result of that is you get a negative frequency, which can't exist, right? But we can use that mathematically as a way to tell the computer, hey, look for, a, for an imaginary frequency, look for a negative frequency, and that's gonna be a transition state for something. Because it's just telling you that for most of these dimensions, you still want it to be concave up. But in one dimension, you want it to be concave down and looking for that maximum. And that's what we get. That's how we can get geometries like this and show them is we can calculate what that energy is that gives you that potential energy maximum. And that gives you an idea of what the activation energy will be. Right. Those were always the trickiest ones to find because some there's a transition state energy just for rotating a carbon, right? Think about those eclipsed versus the staggered conformations. So if you just start from a stable structure and you tell the computer, just go find me a negative frequency, it'll find you a negative frequency, but it might just be a methyl rotating somewhere. So you have to get close to what you think the jump, the actual transition state is, and then say, okay, there should be a negative frequency here, isolate it. And if you did everything right, it should give you this. But if you did it wrong, it still might just be a methyl rotating somewhere or something bending out a plane back and forth. Those were, that was the trickiest calculations to do.
When you refer to the computer, do you mean the spectroscopy? So I'm talking about computational chemistry okay. to actually get these geometries okay. and what they look like. Um, we would be basically we feed a bunch of the uh, coordinates in a matrix form to the computer and tell it, okay, basically jiggle these nuclei and find the potential and the lowest energy that you can. And it basically says, okay, for the starting point, I'm just going to calculate what the low, what the energy of all these electrons are. And then I'm going to move one nucleus and see if that energy is lower than what it started as. If it is lower, then you keep it there, and then you try jiggling the rest of them and try and get to the bottom of that potential energy well. And so they call that a geometry optimization. Gotcha. Trying to get everything as low as possible and then trying to find those transition state energies. You know, keep everything as low energy as possible except for this one imaginary frequency. Find that. And find the potential energy maximum for that frequency. And everything else, keep it as low energy as possible. But we're getting into that's the sort of thing that uh, will be an upper division chemistry class. When I was in grad school, um, my advisor taught a class and I TA'd it for there was a special topics class on computational chemistry um, where, we, where we did that. That was a 400 level class. You know, there was about 50 50 grad students and, and fourth year students. Um, it was really fun class TA, but we're we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit just because that's we the background. We open start, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so what that tells us about this SN2 mechanism is that it's second order, which means we can expect the potential energy surface to look like this one step. We know that that transition state is going to look like this, something like this. It might not be perfectly planar based on the size of these uh, nucleophiles and the, how the exact energy of the bond, but it'll be close to planar. At one um, point, it'll be planar, right? At one point, it'll be planar, but that might not be the highest energy state. There's a possibility if this is much smaller physically than this is, mm -hmm. it's possible that your highest energy state is actually with these pointed a little bit more this way because you're forcing this to leave a little bit earlier. But yes, by definition, it will have to be, these hydrogens will have to be planar with the carbon at one point, because just from going here and moving them this way, at one point, the, the plane that's defined by those three hydrogens will hit that carbon. Gotcha. But that's not necessarily the highest. Not necessarily the highest energy state, uh, but it'll be close. Your transition state will look close to those hydrogens being planar with the carbon. All right. So what is that's all useful to know, right? All good information. This all how we can kind of we don't prove things in science in general, and especially when it comes to mechanisms. All we can do is come up with a plausible explanation. And then leave the door open for it to be disproved down the road, right? In science philosophy, they call that being falsifiable. Mm -hmm. If you have a decent understanding of what's happening, your hypothesis should be falsifiable, which means you should be able to prove it wrong. We don't prove things right in the sciences. So we never really have a definitively proven mechanism. We just have mechanisms that are postulated that fit all the evidence as best we can. There's possible that there's a better mechanism out there that nobody's ever thought of. SN2 is a pretty simple mechanism and it's been very well studied for close to a century at this point. So we can be pretty certain, well, but we still have to have that hint of doubt. Math has been studied for way longer and there's way more. And there's still a lot of ambiguity in math, right? Um, so what is this, how does this apply? Well, the, basically what, what we have to have happen, all of these SN2 reactions are going to be equilibrium reactions because everything's an equilibrium reaction technically, right? So really that means that anything that can happen forward can happen backward as well. And is 
all going to be governed. What side is favored is going to be based on those energies. Are your reactants more stable than your products? If your reactants are more stable than your products, then your K is going to be less than one, right? Because that means that at equilibrium, you favor reactants. You can still make a little bit of product, but it's not going to be, um, you know, you're not going to have more than a 50% yield by definition. Um, so what that this means is we can always look at it in terms of these pKa values. These pKa values are a good way for us to estimate which side is going to be favored in equilibrium. Because I can draw this reaction all day. <laughs> but if we want to know which side is favored at equilibrium, we have to come look at the pKa table. So the hydroxide as a leaving group, it's very, very much not a great leaving group, pKa 15.7. Bromide's leaving group's pKa negative nine. Favors the products more. And we can actually, it's not perfect because mathematically it doesn't work out perfect. We need an idea of what what the order of magnitude is of the equilibrium constant by looking at the difference between these pKa values. Right, so negative nine all the way up to 16. So that's a 10 to the 25th difference, right? So we would expect K for this reaction, all of the things be equal, concentrations be equal um, of our leaving groups and our hydroxide. At equilibrium, we should favor making this product. We can, we can say that K should be something in the 10 to the 25 range. Right, obviously that doesn't take everything into consideration because K is products over reactants and concentrations, which means we have to take these into consideration as well. So because you've got, you're making both of these and this, so it's a squared term there, it's not actually going to, if K is 10 to the 25, our concentrations at equilibrium are going to be the square root of that, which is still 10 to the 13. Still really, really very much favors the product. And we can get it to favor the product even more strongly if we play with these concentrations. Um, if we either have some way of removing the bromide as it's formed, or if we can just overload this side with a ton of hydroxide, we can get it to go that way too, just like the English Atelier's principle, right? But either way. As it sits, it would favor the products, right? Right. If we wanted to go back towards the reactants, then that would be what? Jam and pull and throw on the product We could, yeah, we could do that. Or we could do something else where we change what this leaving group is for the back row reaction. This is a better base than the bromide is. So if we've added a ton of acid, one, that's going to decrease this amount. And two, it's going to protonate this. Now all of a sudden we've only got a difference of 10 to the seven. So we can get it to shift back the other way by doing things like changing pH. Yes. And this, Incidentally, this is the reaction, the reverse reaction is what we did for lab, the, what we're doing week two of. We start, we were synthesizing bromobutane from 2-butanol. We weren't getting stereospecific, we just started with a mixture of 2-butanol, um, both stereoisomers, because it costs a lot more to get one specific stereoisomer, and we're not and in theory, though, we could, if we started from R to butanol, we could make S to bromobutane. And there is a way to measure whether or not you made a stereo, a um, one specific stereoisomer. Um, it's just, it's very, very esoteric piece of equipment. We have it because it's actually not very high tech, um, but there's not a whole lot of value in showing that you did that. 
Um, at least to my mind, I remember doing that lab when I was an undergrad and it was a whole bunch more work for something that was like, cool, it's the R version. <laughs> we proved what we already knew. Um, <laughs> All right, so for each of these, if we're keeping track, if it is SN2, so it's concerted, goes through an umbre umbrella flip for each of these. What is your product going to be for each of these reactions? As far as answering these questions on a test, if I just say what's the product, you don't need to show the mechanism. For the simple mechanisms like this, it can still be an advantage just to, to practice uh, and just remind yourself what's going on. But to answer the question, all you need to do is draw this. Um, especially when we get into these longer multi-step mechanisms, you're not going to want to show every step of the mechanism. If I just say what's the product, you can just skip to the net result. Um, for these one step, or these concerted mechanisms, though. So the methyl group doesn't switch, doesn't move at all, because we didn't touch that stereo center, right? The active carbon. You think of this as being flat and the bromine going into the board, your nitrogen is coming from in front of the board, pushing the bromine away. So now it's trans. And both of these, if I'm being careful, should have your leaving group as a as a secondary product, right? It's just a spectator. But it's yeah, in, in the in terms of organic chemists usually care more about whatever's carbon based than they care about whatever left your carbon molecule. Um, so you'll notice me getting sloppy sometimes like that, but that's always there. And we do need to remember if we do things like write out the equilibrium expression. And that's where it gets important to not get sloppy. All right. Easy enough, as long as this is the only mechanism we're dealing with, right? So the rates of these, so I guess the other thing is um, these equilibrium constants and how good of a leaving group you have versus how strong of a nucleophile you have, that's going to affect your rates as well. Because the more downhill in energy you get, you get so let's say we had had one where the there was not a very strong difference between your leaving group and your nucleophile. The pKa's are close to the same. The more the larger difference you have in energy between your reactants and products, the bigger your K value is going to get. Right, the more you're going to favor products. But that has a secondary effect of usually that also is going to lower your transition state energy as well. So it's also going to speed your reactions up. Not only does equilibrium favor products more, you get there faster. Because at, at, at its uh, most basic, you can think of these potential energy minimums as being parabolas that overlap. 
you've got these overlapping parabolas. The intersection here is your transition state, right? If you drop this parabola down, their intersection drops as well. If it's the same mechanism, it's possible for something to be more down in the energy, but then simultaneously have a higher barrier, but only if you have two different mechanisms happening. So if we're talking about the same mechanism, more down in the energy also means faster. That would also mean that gives free energy is less positive to make that happen. Correct, or more negative. more negative. It gives free energy is negative for both of those. Right. More negative, I said yeah. less positive. You said, hey, yeah, same thing. <laughs> same, same thing, but just shift your frame of reference. Right, right. <laughs> um, the other thing we can measure about these, for these different, if we had the same leaving group, but with more sterics around it, that's not really going to affect the, the activation energy so much as it's going to affect that, that pre exponential factor. So remember that, or the pre Arrhenius factor. Right? Because remember, your rate constant is equal to this constant here that had all the geometry pieces, right? And the probability that they, that they interact with the right orientation. And then you had E to the minus activation energy over RT. So better leaving group is going to drop activation energy, make it faster. More stuff getting in the way decreases the probability that your nucleophile bumps into the carbon with the right orientation. So in other words, sterics slow things down. And that's not affecting your activation energy in most cases. In most cases, that's actually going to be affecting A. Because the activation energy is all just about how good of a leaving group do you have and how good of a nucleophile you have. Neither of those change by adding a bunch of methods around it, right? But the odds of getting there change. Mm -hmm. Would like tertiary carbocations being more stable than primary carbocations contribute to that as well because they'd be less reactive? We're going to get to the carb. We don't, we're not actually making any carbocations in this one because right. it's concerted, yeah. but we will be in the other mechanism. So hold that thought. Okay. Very good. Um, I was mainly just pausing to let you digest and to come up with a good sports analogy. Hysterics is like is like your offensive line. Having a good offensive line doesn't actually slow down the defenders, right? The defenders run their 40 at the same speed, no matter what offensive line they're playing against. And the quarterback is the same as just as elusive, regardless of the offensive line, but he can slow down the defensive line getting to the quarterback by just being in the way. And that's basically what these sterics are doing. He's, they call it specific, I keep saying sterics, but really I should be saying steric hindrance. Sterics just means stuff has size and big things push on other big things. Specifically adding these other carbons around hinder your nucleophile from getting to the active carbons. We call that steric hindrance. But as long as we're all on the same page with that, we can just call it the sterics or getting in the way. Um, so out of these, which of these four molecules is going to be the most reactive? It's if we're just looking at the chlorides, so ignoring this one for now. We can rank all the chlorides, right, by saying, okay, this one has the least steric hindrance, so it should be the fastest. And then we've got these other ones. So out of the chlorides, one fastest, second fastest, third fastest. So the bromide's a better leaving group. So the bromide's a better leaving group, so we want to go back and look at our table yeah. and and decide, okay, well, that's one of the things where you need you need a little bit more experience to be able to say we've got two competing variables here. Um 
with it being a factor of bromine to chlorine is only a factor of 10 to the 2 difference. So probably your chloromethane is probably going to be the fastest. And then the bromine. So one, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, four across, yeah. Um, but that is one where you, you'd have to like double check it. Either this is number one or two, and this is number one or two. Three and four are the same. All right, so <laughs> the problem is when we actually do this experiment, we actually find that what should be this, a really, really slow reaction, we do this under the right conditions, this is actually really fast as well. And so that tells us that there's something else going on. Now go back to your other question. So this has more sterics to slow down the SN2, but we also had another possible mechanism, the concert or the stepwise mechanism. This is going to have the most stable intermediate out of all of these, even though it has the most sterics slowing down your nucleophile. It's going to have the most stable intermediate. So basically. If it's an SN2 reaction, our, our reactivity goes the way we expect it here. However, SN1 reactions also happen under the right conditions. And that was really confusing when they were first trying to figure this out. They're like, okay, cool, SN2, I think we understand what's going on here. And then they do the experiment and find out that it reacts backwards <laughs> to what they thought, but only with the right solvents and only with the right leaving groups and nucleophiles. Seems right. to happen every time the try to figure something no. out. <laughs> right. Every time we, we put a handle on something, we add another layer of, of complexity to it, right? And that has to do with just it would be a lower activation energy because it's more stable energy. Exactly. So if we're talking about if it's SN1, then we add SN1, then your first step is just chlorine leaves. Make this. And then, and that's your slow step. And then your fast step is then any nucleophile that has like any lone pairs at all is going to be attracted to this, right? Because you've got an empty spot in your P orbital for that carbon. That's really unstable. So anything with a lone pair can then come in here and react, even if it's a pretty weak nucleophile. And so whatever that winds up being, it can even just be, say, a water molecule as a lone pair that can come in and attach there, right? That's all going to happen very quickly. So your rate determining step is still just leaving group leaves. The other aspect of this it is if it goes through an SN1 reaction, if it's stepwise, what's the geometry look like of a carbocation? Is it still tetrahedral? It's planar. It's sp2, right? Because those that empty p orbital is not hybridized, mm -hmm. which means you lose all your stereochemistry if it's SN1. Because, so think about it, go back to, to bromobutane again. When the bromine leaves and takes its electrons, okay, sure, it was R, but now it's trigonal planar. And now it doesn't have any preference. Your nucleophile can come from above or below. And so we should get a 50 50 mixture of both of your stereoisomers if it's SN1. If it's SN2, we, get the we should side. get just the backside attack. And so we can measure that too. We can do different experiments at different temperatures. Does it favor SN1 or SN2? In different solvents, does it favor SN1 versus SN2? At different pHs, does it favor SN1 versus SN2? 
right? So we always are going to have sort of that balancing act. Is that we're going to be doing day with the little detail, at least a little bit, playing with the, or are we just going to be purifying? We're just going to be purifying. We, you can take bromo butane and separate it into its constituent stereoisomers to get R versus S preferentially. Um, we're, not interested. we're not, we're not that interested in that. Sure. All right, let's end there for today. And then in, uh, in lab, like I was, I was talking to David, um, if it's just the two of you, then you're working with yours and I'm just going to have you work with the other groups because they're not here. Okay. Um, otherwise, yeah, hopefully we'll have some more people show up with more hands, and more eyes is always helpful in lab. Um, but uh, we'll get started on that at one o'clock. I mean, we could work together online just so we're not stuck on their tip, but I mean, at the same time, it's probably gone bad. So we can't it's true. we have waited two weeks um, and I wasn't thinking we should have put it in the fridge. Oh shit! We have a fridge now. I'm not even putting it in a real lab again. Um, so we should have put it in the fridge because that. Although now that I think about that, we did that before and it actually didn't work because it messed with the equilibrium. Um, I still drop it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see who shows up. Right. We're not going to make any decisions right now, but either way, we'll get we'll go through it and uh, go from there. Oh yeah. I was in a, the chemistry.